everybody. Happy Mother's Day. I just want to really wish all the moms a happy, happy Mother's Day. I know how hard you work and you do it so well. I think all of you are super moms. And I'm just honored to be here tonight opening our brand new series called Restored. And we're going to be looking at people in this series um, in the Bible who have experienced God's amazing transforming power. I wonder if you ever question, can God use you? You know, sometimes we feel like God can't use us because maybe because of something in our past, uh, maybe something that we've done, or, or maybe something that was done to us. And we feel like we have some scars. Um, we feel like maybe we've been abused, or, or maybe we've just done something and we really regret it. And we feel like, how could God use somebody like me? You know, I have all this stuff in my past. And um, sometimes we feel like God can't use us because we're going through a really difficult time right now, or we've been dealt some really difficult circumstances. Maybe you're dealing with some debt, or maybe going through a divorce, or you have a difficult job situation. Maybe something's up with one of your kids and they're struggling, and you just feel like, well, how can God use me? I, I'm not perfect, I'm struggling. But God specializes in restoration. He loves using people that he restores. Um, have you guys ever restored something? Anybody like to restore things, like, um, like an old car? Some people really like, like finding furniture on the side of the road and restoring it. I don't really like that stuff. <laughs> but some people do. But you know, um, recently, I kind of restored something, I'll tell you about it. We have a trampoline at our house. We've had one for a number of years and, and we have four kids so it's like a good way for them to get their energy out and go out and just bounce and bounce and bounce. But you know, over the years, like our trampoline just went through some stuff with four kids bouncing on it. Well, the first thing that happened to it wasn't because of the kids, but we had um, a bunch of leaves that collected in there in the fall. And Judah thought it would be a great idea to just use the leaf blower to get those leaves out. Now, it has like an enclosure, you know, around the trampoline that is supposed to keep the kids in. So he's in there with the, the backpack leaf blower, and he's leaf blowing, and he's backing up, and he's like, this is awesome, getting the leaves out. But he didn't know that the leaf blower was burning holes in the enclosure. It just it melted like these holes in the enclosure. So now the thing, it just, I mean, it looked like a piece of junk after that. So we like zip tied it, you know, to, you know, tighten it up. And after a while, those got like ripped open again. And we did have a kid fall out one time. And then, you know, then a limb came down after a storm and it made like, you know, kind of a small hole in the trampoline. So we were like, ah, I think it's all right. So, you know, the kids were still playing on it and I you know would just kind of try not to look but over time that hole got bigger and bigger and then it was like yeah I, I can't just turn a blind eye anymore so that was the last time that we used the trampoline when that hole finally got really big but the kids were really missing having this trampoline it was just like this big piece of junk in the backyard so we thought about it and we realized that you know if we ordered a few parts it would be cheaper than or than buying a brand new one and, and we looked back there, we figured it out. It was really just the frame and the springs that were still good. But we ordered the new parts, we put them on, and the thing is like brand new, completely brand new. So for your notes, because I think I missed one for you, God specializes in restoring people. He specializes in restoring people. And also for your notes, Jesus can restore us as if we have never been broken, as if we've never been broken. So today we're going to be looking at someone who has a very checkered past, and she had a very broken life, and her name is Mary Magdalene. So here's what we know about Mary Magdalene. Magdalene is not her last name, like you might think. I was kind of disappointed because it's such a beautiful, beautiful name. 
Um, but her name comes from the town where she was from. So she was from a fishing village on the Sea of Galilee that was called Magdala. So they took Magdala and they made it into Mary Magdalene, meaning, meaning Mary who is from Magdala. Now if you try that with your own name, it might not sound as beautiful as that. I tried it with my name and I was not impressed because I do not like Carrie Southington at all. <laughs> But go ahead and try it with your name and see what you think. So that's how they named her. So that way, when they talk about Mary Magdalene, we know which Mary they're talking about because there's a lot of Marys in Scripture. So she is mentioned 12 times by name in Scripture, which interestingly enough is more than any of the disciples and also more than any other woman in the Gospels besides Jesus' own family. So she's a pretty, pretty famous lady. Now, some people have written books and said things about Mary Magdalene, like saying that she might have been the wife of Jesus. But when we look through the Bible, there's absolutely no evidence of her being Jesus' wife. There's also no historical evidence. So no biblical evidence of that and no historical evidence of that. All right, we're going to be reading in Luke chapter 8. And we're going to dig up a little dirt on Mary. We're going to find out what's going on with her. going to give her a little background check. Luke 8, verse 1. It says, Soon afterward, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Seven demons! I mean, that's a lot of demons. Now, we don't know um, the nature of these demons. So they may have been um, spiritual in nature. They may have been psychological issues that she was having. They could have been physical ailments, like a sickness or something like that. Or they could have been a combination. We don't really know. But we do know what that word demon means. When we look at that word in the Greek, the definition is that it's a spirit. So she had seven of these spirits. But it's defined as a being that is inferior to God, but is superior to men. So in other words, she was dealing with seven issues that were greater than she could handle. They were way too much for her. They were tremendous burdens. They were absolutely superior to her. She could not overcome them on her own. So you and I may not be able to relate to being demon-possessed, but have you ever dealt with a demon or a problem in your life that you felt like was superior to you? I know I have something that was greater than your own ability to fight it. There's a lot of things I think that would fit into this category. And some of the ones uh, that I was thinking about were like an addiction to drugs or alcohol or maybe a toxic relationship, a bad habit. I know some of you bite your nails. <laughs> maybe, maybe a mental illness or a depression, a stronghold, like just something that you just can't overcome a past abuse and the thoughts that you get from a past abuse, a fear or a worry that just won't leave you alone, I get those, or anything really that you feel like torments you. I think we can all relate better to Mary Magdalene when we look at it this way. But her demons were not too much for Jesus. And in the scripture that we read, it says that he cured her. Your problems and your demons are also inferior to God. They may be greater than you can handle. They may be superior to you, but they are inferior to God, even though you may not realize it. I hope you will realize that today. For your notes, God is superior to the problems you face. Whatever problems they may be, and they may be spiritual ones, they may be physical sicknesses, physical ailments. They may be mental problems, mental issues that you have, some hang-ups that you have. But he's superior to all of them. So 
Before Mary Magdalene met Jesus, we see that she, she's quite afflicted. But she meets Jesus, and there's a transformation that takes place. Now, we're going to have to back up. We're going to have to read over the verse that we just read again, or we're going to miss two really important pieces of information. Now, I've read this a whole bunch of times, and you know, often just kind of like skim over it and missed a couple really good details here. Jesus is on a ministry tour. It says he's on a ministry tour with his disciples, but the women are also there on the tour. So it says he took his 12 disciples with him. This is, ver this is verse one, along with some women. Now, I just never noticed that before. You know, we hear a lot about the disciples. They're like the dream team, the 12. Even if we didn't grow up in church, we know Jesus had 12 disciples. But here we see, it says it right there, along with them on the ministry tour were some women. And I just never noticed that before. I thought that was really neat. But they are not just along on the tour, on the ministry tour, on the Jesus tour. They're like part of the band too. They are playing a vital role in his ministry and we're gonna see exactly what part they're playing. So why is it so important that the women were there? Well, I'll give you a little background on that. Now for a boy in uh, this time period, learning from a rabbi was like getting like a college education. It was kind of like a big deal. If you were studying under a rabbi, it was a huge honor. So most boys would have been taught at home or in school or both until they were about 13. At the age of 13, they would learn the family trade, or if their family didn't have a trade, then they would maybe go and apprentice under somebody else, but they would be learning some type of trade. If they were really special, exceptional students, and they had the aptitude, then a rabbi might ask them to come and study under him. And it was years and years and years of study before that man could become a rabbi. So it was like a big deal even for a man to be able to study under a rabbi. Now, for the women, it was completely different. So women were not allowed to learn from rabbis at all. This was men's work. Most girls had absolutely no formal education unless their parents were maybe teachers or if they were very, very well off. So what we see here with Jesus allowing the women to be with him is absolutely unheard of and no other rabbi was doing this. It was a little bit outside of the box. As we know, Jesus was like that. He loved doing everything differently and opposite of what everybody else expected him to do. So this is so special because Mary is a woman. Not only that, what we also know about her is she had seven demons. I mean, she's not exactly, you know, what people would think were qualified, a qualified person to be, you know, studying ministry. But Evidently, Jesus thought she was qualified because she was transformed. So this is huge. This is really, really special. All right, there's another little bit here that we're going to read, verse 3. All right, so this tells us the names of some of the other women who were also um, on the Jesus tour. It says, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. So this, this other little piece of information is really super important too. It says they were contributing from their own resources to support Jesus and his disciples. So that is also something that a rabbi's disciples would do. That wasn't something that just anybody would do, but a rabbi's disciples, they would contribute. So here we see that the women are acting as a rabbi, as Jesus' disciples. So what they would do is they would pool their money, kind of like how you would do if you were going to take a vacation with friends, you know? So like they pool their money, they get the rental car together, you know, they get their groceries, and then they go on the Jesus tour together. So that, that's what's happening here. So it's really pretty neat. It's totally unconventional, but that's what Jesus is doing. This is how he is running his ministry. So Jesus freed Mary Magdalene from a lot and she didn't take it for granted. You know, she could have said, hey, 
thank you, Jesus, you know, and walked away, went back to her, her quiet life. But she did not waste the life that she was given. Have you guys ever seen a transformation that either it wasn't like real or it didn't last? Like I'm thinking about like, like diet plans and stuff like that where, you know, people go on a diet plan and they gain a bunch of weight and then like really soon after, it's like they didn't really learn like good habits so they gain all the weight back on. You guys remember glamour shots? Anybody remember a couple people? <laughs> Glamour shots was like, they have them at the mall. It was like a photo studio. And now if you were a girl growing up in the 90s, if you were like 10 years old in the 90s, glamour shots was really, really cool. So you would go into glamour shots and you would get to look at like all these amazing clothes. I mean like the ones with like the geometric patterns and like the sequins and like the big shoulder pads. And there were like some jean jackets in there and like some floppy hats that you could wear to the side. So you could pick out like whatever clothes you liked and then they would take you and put you in a chair and they would like do your makeup with like the bright pink blush and like the hot pink lipstick and, and all that stuff. And then, and then they would take these amazing pictures of you and you thought like, I will never look this good again. You know, it was like so great. Like you felt so good about yourself seeing those pictures. But you know, when you leave glamour shots, you don't get to take those super cool clothes with you. So after that makeover, you go back to your old self, right? That's an outward temporary transformation, not a true transformation. For your notes, our outward actions should reflect our inward transformation. You know, another outward transformation that I was thinking about is when people just try to change their outward behavior. Like they think, you know, I should just try to be nicer. You know, I should go to church. I should maybe try, you know, talking better and, and not swearing, that sort of thing. You know, that's not really a true transformation either. You know, anybody can just follow rules. But Jesus intended that our actions be a reaction to what's taken place in our hearts. Like we recognize how much God loves us, therefore we love others. He transforms us and we react by serving others, by bringing other people to the, the transformer. The change starts on the inside and then our actions naturally follow. You know, Jesus was always talking to the religious leaders of his time about this because they were so guilty of it. They were rule followers. They tried to follow the rules. They tried to make other people follow the rules, but they didn't really love others. They weren't really transformed by God on the inside. They thought the rules were more important than the people. So outwardly, they, they did the right things. And it, it's not bad to do the right things, but it's just that in their hearts, nothing had changed. They didn't really have a heart to follow God. Mary Magdalene's transformation was internal. And we know that because her transformation led to a life of service. So her relationship with Jesus, it wasn't just like a part of her life. It wasn't just a story that she told, like, hey, he cured me, and that was so nice of him. Uh, it was her life. For your notes, if you've been transformed, the only reasonable response is to serve him. All right, the next scripture that we're going to look at, it gives us a little more detail about the role that the women played in Jesus' ministry. So here we are now. We're, we're at the crucifixion of Jesus. Jesus is on the cross, and this is what it says in Matthew 27, 55. It says, there were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now, this sounds like it's just a, 
a verse is just like trying to inform us, doesn't it? Like, I've read this a lot of times too and just never really saw what was here because it's kind of like, hey guys, this is who was at the cross. It's kind of like a little like attendance record, you know? It's like, it's like, okay, we're at the cross and here's who was there. But there's actually more than that here because it says that these women, they had followed Jesus from Galilee. So again, we see that the women are an integral part. They are with Jesus. They are on the ministry tour. They're on the Jesus tour with him. They are also, if you see here, it says that they were, so they not only were contributing um, financially, but it says that they were ministering to him. So that means that they were caring for his needs. They were taking care of him along the way. So they were the ones who were making sure that he had food, right? A clean robe, a toothbrush, like that he's getting to bed on time. Like, hey, don't forget, crucifixion, it's tomorrow. Good night's sleep, you know? I, I know they were, I just know, you know? You know, Jesus like pushing the broccoli to the side. Mary's like, I saw that, you know? So they were there taking care of Jesus and his disciples. They were an integral part. They were serving. They were making the most of what Jesus had done in their lives. So we don't know if Mary Magdalene was a mother, but she certainly had the heart of a mother by the way that she served. Moms serve all the time, every day. Uh, for your notes, you don't have to be a mother to serve like one. We can serve anybody who is around us. So even when the going is getting really tough for Jesus, Mary is there. It's not looking good for him at all. He's on the cross, but Mary is still there. If he needs something, she's there. She owes her transformed life to him, and she remains loyal to him even in his darkest hour. All right, so Jesus is crucified. Now let's see what Mary Magdalene is up to now. Mark 16, verse 1. Saturday evening when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. So she purchases her the embalming spices for Jesus' body. So here we see that she is contributing out of her own resources again. So contributing her own money. Even in Jesus' death, she is serving him. She gets to the tomb. She sees the stone has been rolled away and an angel delivers the good news. He is risen and the angel instructs her to go and tell his disciples. Mark 16, 9. After Jesus rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. So Mary Magdalene gets to be the first person to find out that Jesus is risen. And she's also the first person to actually see him in the flesh after the resurrection. So why is this so special that she sees him first? Well, her being the first one there, her witness adds tremendous credibility to the resurrection story. Why? Because like we learned earlier, most women, they were not educated. So a woman was, could not be considered a witness in court. They were considered very terrible witnesses. Nobody would listen to a woman if she told a story like this. Her witness was just not as credible as a man's. So God still let her be the first to see Jesus. And it just adds so much credibility to the story because if somebody was trying to make up a story about Jesus rising from the dead, they wouldn't have picked a woman as their main character. They definitely would have picked a man. So we know that the story is true because here we have a woman being the first person to see him. So we see a shift is taking place here. So Jesus is risen from the dead, his new kingdom is being ushered in, and the women are becoming equal. A lot of people say that, you know, they, they read the Bible and they feel like that, you know, the women are not equal. But if we look at Jesus's ministry, 
we see, as we saw what we read today, that he makes it a point to value them from the very beginning of his ministry. They are there with him. Nobody else is doing that. Jesus is the only one who's got the women on the team, right? He values them throughout his ministry. He uses them in his ministry. He allows them to contribute financially to his ministry. No other rabbi is doing that. They are key players in the resurrection story. The first people to see him are women. And it's the most important story in the Bible. It's the most important story for our faith. So Mary Magdalene was rewarded for her service and her loyalty to Jesus by getting to be the first person to see him. She was transformed by him. And the key is that she never forgot the one who transformed her. 2 Corinthians 5.15, it says, he died, that's Jesus, he died for, what does it say? Everyone. So that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. So it says that those who receive his new life... They no longer live for themselves, but for Christ. And, and that was the example that Mary Magdalene set for us. Once Jesus cured her, transformed her, cured her of those seven demons, those seven afflictions, she devoted her life totally and completely to him. Now, that new life that was available to Mary with the seven demons. That's also available to me and to you, no matter what you're facing today. Jesus offers a new beginning. He's the God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, hundredth chances. In your notes, uh, God always offers another chance. There's always just one more chance and one more and one more. Mary Magdalene was transformed, and then she walked in that transformation. She chose to serve Jesus and those around her, so she was no longer living for herself, but living for others. Now, you might be here today thinking like, well, yeah, I mean, Jesus was there, you know, she could just like do stuff for him. Well, what can I do? Well, we can serve those around us. We can serve every person that we know. We can tell every person that we know that God has transformed us and they can have that transformation too. You may be here today and, and Jesus has transformed you, but you know you aren't serving him to the fullest. Maybe you haven't stopped living for yourself yet. Or maybe, I was thinking about this, maybe you forgot what he did for you. You know, some of us that have maybe been Christians a long time, you know, we kind of forgot, like, what we were before he found us. And we just said, thank you, Jesus. You know, we kind of just went about our lives. But it doesn't have to be that way. Maybe God is calling you to, to get involved today, to get involved in ministry and maybe to serve him here at Thrive. He may be calling you to just love those around you at work or at school or at home. He might be calling you to missions. He might be calling you to go and share the gospel in other places. And he might be calling you to serve your family, serve your little kids. Serve your adult kids. Serve your parents, your spouse. There are people everywhere that we can serve. Maybe you're in another group of people, and maybe you've never been transformed by Jesus, but you're hearing about this new life that he gives, this healing that he gives, and you're interested. Well, Jesus died on the cross, and he rose from the grave so that that healing forgiveness, 
is available to you. It's available to everyone. You might be here today struggling with a demon or struggling with a problem. Or you may be on the other side. You might feel like, hey, life is great right now. I'm just sitting on top of the world. Everything's good. Well, either way, either category you fit into, God blesses those who recognize their need for him. We all need him. You know, whether it's a good day, it's a bad day, a good year, a bad year, we need Jesus. We need his healing. We need his forgiveness. Sometimes we just need his help, right? Life can be hard. We just need his help. Well, whatever category you're in, we're going to pray. And we'll give you an opportunity to talk to Jesus today, allowing him to transform you. Let's pray. Father, we just, we just thank you that you made transformation possible when you died on the cross for us. We thank you that with you dying and, and being raised to life, that you offer us forgiveness for our past sins, our past regrets. And you offer hope and you offer healing for our hurts, for our habits, for whatever it is that is wearing us down. Father, we thank you that when you transform us, we are as if we had never been broken. And we are not the same anymore, but you give us a new life. Thank you, Father, that you completely restore us. You make us good as new. Now, the Bible tells us that if we say with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we can be saved. It's as simple as that. So if you're here today and you recognize that you want, you need God's transforming power in your life, I just invite you to just tell him, just say, God, I believe that Jesus is Lord and I believe that you raised him from the dead. That's all you have to do to begin experiencing that transforming power in your life. Father, I just lift up each one today, each of us here today. Father, I pray that we would experience your transforming power today. Father, I pray for those that don't know you, that they would reach out to you, that they would be healed, Father, that they would know the power of your forgiveness, that you would bring them close. I pray that they would hear your still small voice speaking to them, nudging them, urging them into a loving relationship with you. Father, I, I lift up those here today who have known you for a long time. Father, I pray you would help us not to forget the ways that you have transformed us. Help us not to forget the healing that you brought to us. Help us not to forget the sins that were forgiven. Father, I pray that you would guide us by your Holy Spirit in serving others, in loving others. Father, open our eyes to see the people around us who need to be served, who need to know the transforming power of your love. God, I just pray that we would never, never forget what you have done for us. And we thank you for the work that you're doing here in and through us, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you could please stand with us.